Um, so welcome to the Linux IP Sec tutorial. I'm Salmini from Oracle. So in the first half of the talk, I'll do the I'll walk through the Linux kernel data path, um, and then in the second half, Paul Bowders will do the fun stuff. He'll walk us through a hands-on lab. He'll tell us about LibreSwan. We'll see it all come alive, and you know, do the real stuff. So here's the agenda for the talk. I'm going to start off by very quickly going over the IPsec and IIC terminology and definitions. This is just a recap. Most people may already know this stuff, but just to make sure we're all on the same page. And then um, I'll walk through the kernel data path by taking a UDP packet and tracing uh, the TX and RX path. So basically, we'll walk the packet all the way through the transmit side, see the main functions that are involved, the data structures involved, and similarly on the receive side. So that if you ever have to explore this on your own, you'll kind of know what to look for. And then, in, and then I'll hand off to Paul, who will do the control plane walkthrough. He'll tell us about LibriSwan, how to set up Ike, what is Ike, all the new, new features in it, and then we'll have a lab. So um, let's start off by looking at the terminology and definitions. First of all, what is IPsec? IPsec stands for IP security. It is a suite of protocols that covers encryption through the ESP-based protocols and authentication through the AH-based protocols. For the purpose of this talk, I'll just stick with ESP from the interests of time. The same principles apply to AH. So um, IPsec behavior is controlled by two key databases in the kernel. One of these is the security policy database, the SPD, and the, sec uh, the second one is the security association database, which the kernel calls SADB. Right? So the SPD tells you what you want to done with a packet. So it tells you things like, for pack so it'll have policies like for, for packets in 13.0.0 um, slash 24, I want you to do IPsec, ESP. So how you actually do that, you have to figure out by looking at the SADB. So there you'll have rules which say for packets from 13.1 to 13.2, apply some algorithm like AES GCM 256, and then all the parameters you need to apply that algorithm. The policy database can have, uh, so each thing that you're doing, like an ESP is uh, operation on the packet, transforms the packet. So the SPD might have multiple transforms. You may say, do ESP and then do compression, right? So it can have, in, in Linux, this is called templates. So you might have multiple transforms in the SPD. And like I said, to actually do that policy, you have to go and find the uh, association in the SADB. And while your policy may cover a whole subnet, in my example, it covers all the entire 13 slash 24 subnet, in the SADB, you need a host to host entry, like 13.1 to 13.2. The uh, prescribed way to create that entry is to use uh, a protocol like Ike, Internet Key Exchange, to which actually runs, negotiates, and uh, figures out what, what each site supports and computes some strong key. The other way to do it is to have two administrators pick up the phone, call up each other, and say, hey, let's use this key today. But obviously, that's brittle, right? So uh, Paul will tell us about Ike and all the good things it does for us. So um, for walking through the examples that I'll be looking at today, I had actually set up uh, an SPD and an SADB entry in my test machine. And we'll be looking at this over and over again. Essentially, the policy I set up is to say that encrypt all UDP packets to the 13 subnet using ESP. So that's the first thing you see in there. And I've given the short form version of it, which is IPXP, but the full long version of it is to say IPXFRM policy. Uh, what that will do for you is dump the contents of your SPD. Right? In my case, my host machine had a 13.8 local address. So that's what you see as the source. And it's saying do ESP for all UDP packets to 13 slash 24. Now, when I actually generated all the data for this slide deck, I had to send a packet from 13.8 to 13.9. And the way I'd set it up is the first packet that hits that policy and needs an association would then trigger Ike. It will go to the LibriSwan stuff, kick off the Ike negotiation, and get me an actual security association. And that's called the acquiring a policy. Right? And that's how I got that entry which you show in the IPXS or IPXFRM state. Right? That tells you everything about the security association. It tells you the source and destination and a number of things that we'll come back to as we go over the rest of the slide deck. For example, we look at what is the SPI. We will look at the line which says, the last line which says selector source 13.8. We'll see where that fits in in the kernel. Uh, the AEAD stuff, we'll see where that comes back. So we'll come back to this information over and over. The one thing I want to note is that there's something in red over there, which is the actual key. 
So this key, if you have it, you can decrypt the entire conversation. So obviously the output of this command only should be available to trusted users. Right? With that key, you basically know everything about the connection. Some more definitions before we jump in into the data path. Transport mode versus tunnel mode. So this tells you what part of your um, IP packet you are going to encrypt. So if you just take a simple TCP IP packet that goes over Ethernet, right? If you decide to do ESP on everything that, that is the TCP header and TCP payload, then you are in transport mode. You have not changed the IP source and destination. You have encrypted the TCP header and payload, so that's protected. So your routing information is not modified. And this is typically used for host-to-host -host IPsec. The um, IPsec mode that most of us more commonly use when we do things like VPNs is the tunnel mode. Essentially what we do here is we take everything at the IP header and beyond and we, we um, encrypt that and put it inside another IP packet. The outer IP packet has the source and destination that our VPN wants us to put. So it's the VPN source and VPN destination. So basically we've changed the routing information. Right? And this is the IPsec tunnel mode. Now, one thing to note is that when Paul and I talk, and this is terminology we'll commonly see in, in all of the SWAN code, everything is called a tunnel. Even transport mode is called a tunnel. The tunnel there is signifying anything that is an IPsec security association. So when you put something over ESP, we're tunneling it over ESP. So you have to keep the distinction clear between transport mode, tunnel mode, and an IPsec tunnel. So, more definitions. ESP, so this is, the, this is the way we encrypt packets. What we do here is we take whatever part of the data we are going to encrypt, we add an ESP header and then an ESP trailer. The ESP header has this number, which is the SPI, the Security Parameter Index. So a couple of slides ago, we saw an example of the SPI right here. So you see that 9DE792FC, that's your SPI. And that gets added in your um, ESP header. Think of it as uh, the port numbers in TCP or UDP. It identifies the flow. And on the receiver, it's used to quickly pick, up, pick out the SA. Right? The ESP header also has a sequence number. This is to prevent un, uh, again, protect against replay attacks. So a man in the middle cannot pick up a packet and replay it and attack the connection. Uh, the trailer has a number which contains the protocol number of the original payload before it was encrypted. And this will make more sense when you see the pictures in the next two slides. So let's say we had a simple TCP packet going over IP with an Ethernet header. Let's, this, is, this is your most basic TCP packet going out on the wire. If I decide to encrypt everything from the TCP header and payload on, and onwards, right, and I leave the 10.1 and 10.2 alone, I am in transport mode. And that's what you see here. So your ESP header would have the SPI, and the trailer would say the original packet before it was encrypted was a TCP packet. The IP header so source and destination have not been changed, so you've not changed the routing. Whereas if you did tunnel mode, you would encrypt everything starting from the IP header and then going forward to the TCP header and TCP payload. And that's what you see here. So the gray stuff is now the IP plus TCP plus TCP payload. Right? And the ESP trailer says the original packet was an IP packet, so it's an IP and IP, so the trailer says the protocol was four. Right? And your outer IP header now has the VPN source and VPN destination, not necessarily 10.1 and 10.2. So, yes? What's the reason for putting it in the header and in the trailer and not just in the header, in the protocol? That's how the packet thing format is defined. I think the ESP header is just a few bytes and the trailer has the thing. I don't know exactly why it was done that way. Is there, do you know? So, so if I remember that for transport mode, you're actually trying to um, change the, as little as possible of the original header, so you only put it somewhere else, so that the original header sort of stays uh, as similar to the original packet, so that uh, I, th I think that was the, mo the main motivation of putting it in the end of the... Was the question... So, so I didn't catch the question. Do you want to put it in the ESP header in the, or, or in the IP header? So, so like I said, I, I think they tried to keep the, head, the original header as original as possible and just add on anything new that was needed to the end. 
because you, do, you don't want to rebuild the entire header, right? So now you can just change that one entry in the original header, and you don't have to build a whole new header from scratch with all the new options in it, and then put the original payload there. So I think it's just an, an optimization. No, I think he's asking why I have a trailer at all. Why, I have, why not? is encrypted. You want to show anybody the protocol inside. That's the reason why it's not Oh yeah, that's thing. true too. Sorry, yeah, that's true too. The trailer is also encrypted. So, um, your, all your IPsec is only as secure as the key that you've used. And like I said before, you don't want to have static keys. You want to have dynamically negotiated keys. And the recommended way to do this is to use uh, IQ v2, which is defined in the IETF RC 7296. And in uh, Linux, this is done in the Swan packages in a user space daemon that is called Pluto. And Paul is going to tell us all about this, but we'll just keep this as a placeholder to understand how this is going to negotiate our keys when we walk our packet. So now let's jump in into the actual data path, right? So we, I have an SPD that I've set up for my machine, which has source address 13.8, and I want to do ESP on UDP packets to 13 slash 24. Uh, all that code I will describe is based on 4.16, but the principles are the same. Whether you, if you use some other kernel, you should be able to find your way based on that. Uh, the example that I will show will set up a policy, and then we will see an on-demand security association being established. I don't have time to cover IPsec offload, so we're going to uh, skip that for today's talk. So if you're talking about um, UDP, right, you could have a connected socket or a unconnected socket. So in the, the connected socket lets you use send instead of send to, you get back ICMP errors. So when you do a connect, you can only send to one destination. If you have unconnected, you can use one socket to send to multiple destinations. In each case, what happens is, when you actually have to send the packet, you have to figure out what is the next hop, so you have to look up the routing table. So in Linux, that is done in the function IP route output flow, which looks up the forwarding information base, which is the fib lookup. Right, so with that, you figure out the next hop. As part of doing that, it also looks up to see if there is a security policy which applies. That is done in the function XFRM lookup route. So the XFRM here stands for a transform. Everywhere in Linux, you will see IPsec functions being referred to as XFRM something. So you know that then you're an IPsec lab. So essentially what happens is it will look up XFRM route, lookup route, and see if there is a policy which applies. If there is no policy, which is the common case, right, which is the clear traffic case, the uh, routing table lookup is come, going to come back with a success, and it's going to come back with a destination cache entry, which Linux calls a dest entry. This basically is carried with the packet. It's metadata on what to do with the packet, and all, all through the stack, you look up the dest entry for various things, like which function to, should process this next, and any other information you want about the packet. So in the left side of the picture, you see the clear traffic case. There was no policy in that particular example. So the dest entry has a pointer called XFRM, which actually points to the security association. There was no policy which applied, so the XFRM is null. And the dest entry is telling me the next function that should handle this is IP output. So basically, this is clear. You can give it to IP and let it do its thing and send this packet out. On the right, you have the example that we are interested in, which is our UDP packet going to 13.9. Uh, there was a policy which applied. So the next thing it does is it tries to find a security association. Assume that you had a security association. We'll see how that gets generated in a bit, but let's say we have an essay. In that case, what happens is the dest entry that is returned will have a pointer to that security association in the XFRM, which is the red thing there. In Linux, the security association is stored in a structure called XFRM state, right? And the dest entry is also telling me the next function that should process this is XFRM for output because you need to do IPsec on this packet, right? So how did that XFRM get created, right? We just had a policy. We never created an association. How did that get uh, created? So that is the on-demand uh, SA creation stuff. So what happens is when your packet hits the uh, XFRM lookup, it sees a policy, it sees there is no SA, it's going to return E in progress, 
and it's going to return for you, th that error is basically going to tell UDP to drop the packet. If it was TCP, it would hang on to the packet. And at the same time, it also sends an up call to Pluto, to the Ike daemon in user space to negotiate the SA. So the next packet that goes through will find the SA and everything will get encrypted. So how this actually happens, when we do XFRM lookup route, it sees that there is no SA and it sends up a netlink message, which is the number one uh, thing item in this picture. So it sends this up call to, the, to Pluto saying negotiate the SA. So then Pluto does the Ike negotiation, which is the, no, step two in this picture. It does this over UDP. After the SA has been negotiated, both sides agree on the algorithm, the key, and all the other parameters. The SA is added in step three with another netlink message. So the next packet that goes through will find a hit for the SA and it can do the rest of the IPsec processing. So when that happens, XFRM lookup route should return success. It should return the XFRM. At this point, if you had any net filter hooks which applied, they would get applied here. We're not going to look at that for a simple example. We'll just do the basic thing of, OK, next thing to do is IPsec. So that happens in the function XFRM for output. Now, to do all of that, all, all the key information for that is stored in the SA, which is in the XFRM state. So let's look at what that structure looks like. Now, XFRM state has a lot of stuff. And I've simplified that so it could fit in this slide. There's much, much more than this. And we can, if you're interested in the rest of the stuff, we can look at it when we do the lab. But essentially, now you will be able to map all the things in this picture with the output from IPXS that you saw in the earlier slide. So you see the SPI in the ID part. You see the selector, which was the last line in IPXS. You see that over there. You see the algorithm. You see the key also over there. And there are additional properties, bookkeeping stuff that the kernel has to track for the algorithm. And then there are function pointers on how to process this next, which is the XFRM mode. Now, one note here is this is a highly simplified picture. There are actually three different XFRM modes, and I will not go into the details of that. But if you download my slide deck, you'll find that in the backup slides. For now, we'll just say, OK, there's an input, there's an output, AF info, so this is where I go next. Okay. So logically, think, OK, so the next thing I do is the output function, XFRM for transport output. But no, it's not that simple. So what happens next is you go into AF info .output finish. We'll come back into what is this XFRM for transport output in a bit. But basically, the next function that actually does the IPsec stuff is um, XFRM for output finish, which you get through the AF info .output finish. And here, you check to see if hardware offloads are applicable. right? So if, har if you're going to do the crypto offload, you might want to put little hints in the packet on where to start doing the crypto, what are the keys to use, what is the SA to use, and so on. So you do that stuff here. Uh, there is another performance feature in Linux called GSO, Generic Segmentation Offload. The idea here is that for TCP, for example, you want to send a large packet down as much as possible through the stack. So you're not, uh, so you, 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 it's like jumbo frames. So basically, for the same CPU, you're processing a lot of data until it actually comes to handing, it comes time to hand this off to the driver. At that point, what you do is you break that into MTU size TCP segments, put the TCP header, apply the IPsec, and then send it to the driver. So that's called GSO. So if that has been enabled, you want to put hints in the packet on how to do that later on. But we have a simple UDP packet. We're not doing any of these fancy performance features. So where we will end up is uh, in XFRM for output resume. And this is where we actually do all the IP6 stuff. So XFRM output resume will call functions that check if there's space for the ESP header, adds the encapsulation header, checks for key expiration, checks for replay protection. And if everything is fine so far, and we're not offloading the crypto, we actually do the ESP output, encrypt. And now we have the encrypted packet. So now if there were no errors so far, we then jump off to IP local out, so that IP can then take our encrypted packet and send it out. So at this point, if fragmentation is applicable, it will break it down into MTU-sized IP packets. Each fragment will have the IP proto set to be 50, and it will go out on the wire. So that's the TX side. So before I go off to the RX side, any questions, comments? OK, so then we get into the receive side path. So the packet has come out on the other side. And we have to send it up the stack, 
right? There are two cases uh, of how this could be handled, and they are based on whether or not you have this performance feature called GRO, generic receive offload. So GRO is like the counterpart of GSO. Basically, you want to send up a large packet as much as possible through the stack instead of sending a lot of small packets so that for the same processing work, you're processing more data, so you get better bang for your buck, right? So the two cases for IP6 kernel path is whether or not you have GRO. So I will first talk about the no GRO part, and then I will talk about the GRO part. Now, one warning is that a lot of this has a lot of interfaces with the driver, and particularly a feature called NAPI. It's NAPI stands for new API, but it's actually pretty old by now. And <laughs> I have a hand wave through all of the NAPI interfaces. It's all well documented, simply from constraints of time. So if you have questions about that and you want, we can talk about it during the lab. So essentially, most drivers today support NAPI. And NAPI allows you to efficiently switch between pole mode and interrupt mode. So that's why it's a performance feature. And uh, NAPI-enabled drivers will deliver your path packet to you through NAPI GRO receive. So what happens here is that you look at the various headers in your packet, right? So first you look at the Ethernet header. So our packet is an Ethernet. Uh, it's a basic IPv4 over Ethernet, so its type is hex 800. So what happens is it will jump into this function inet GRO receive, where it then looks at the next header, which is the IP header, and sees that the protocol is ESP, which is protocol 50. So now inet GRO receive tries to see if there is an offload point or there's a fun function of, uh, there's an array of indirections, right? So it looks in that table to see if there is an offload enabled. We have not enabled GRO, so our inet offloads for ESP will be null. So then we fall back to the slow path. So that means we go through all the IP processing and we end up in IP receive finish. So again, we have the same problem to solve as we did on the way out. We need to figure, we need to look up the routing table and see if this is a packet for us or if this is a packet that we should forward, right? In our example, this is a packet for us. So when we go and look up the routing table through IP route input, no ref, what will happen is it will again come back to us with a destination cache entry, a dest entry, where the input function pointer is set to IP local deliver. That means the next thing that needs to process this is IP local deliver. So IP local deliver will call, this is the slow path, remember. So it's going to look up the function pointers, the input function pointers in inet protos, which is another array which handles a pointer per protocol number. So it looks it up for ESP. And then it go, takes us into the input function handler, handler for IPsec, which is XFRM for ESP receive. So now we're finally in the IPsec code. Now XF, IPsec itself has a number of different features, and each feature might have its own handler. So in my test machine, I had two of these features. One was basic IPsec enabled, and I also had this thing called VTI enabled. Right? So, I, so the IPsec code, the XFRM for ESP receive, goes through all the applicable handlers to see which ones should be given a copy of the packet. So first, VTI receive gets it. It says, oh, this is not for me. I don't have anything to do with this source and destination. It returns E and val. So then you go to the next handler, which is XFRM4 receive. And here we find our SPD and our SA and everything. So now we are ready to actually eat this packet. So this is where we actually do all of our uh, receive side IPsec. So we look in the packet, we look at the SPI, we find the security association, look at the parameters in the SA, we check the lifetime, we check for replay protection. If there's no hardware offload support, we call ESP input at this point and we decrypt. After we decrypt, we have a UDP packet. So now when we send this packet back to IP local deliver, the UDP input function will get called and it will get sent up the UDP stack as if it came in the clear. So this is, this path, this is the slow path for um, IPsec. This is the case without GRO. There's actually some, there's a lot, some details about how this is actually injected back. I put some notes in there. If you're curious about it, you know, uh, you can look those functions up and find details. <coughs> so this was the no GRO path. Let's look at the case when GRO is enabled. First of all, how do you enable GRO? You could do this manually by loading the kernel module for GRO, which is by doing mod probe ESP4 offload, or if you have some some of the newer drivers that do crypto offload, as soon as you enable crypto offload, it will automatically make sure that GRO offload is also enabled because it's a performance feature. 
So the idea behind all of this is that you first do the decrypt and then send the clear packet back to the GRO callback so that it's handled as if it was a clear UDP IP packet, similar to what we did for the slow path when we did not have GRO. Basically, we took the uh, ESP headache out of the way and then let the regular UDP path do its thing. Right. So when you load the ESP4 offload module, what it does is, uh, remember there was a jump table that was looked up when we uh, looked at the various headers and we said, oh, there's no offload enabled, so it's null. We make sure we populate that, right? So this time when the packet comes in, you would look up the Ethernet type, which is hex 800. It would go take you to INET GRO receive. That would look up INET offloads. And now it's going to find ESP4 GRO receive and say, oh, this is what I need to do for GRO for this protocol type, which is 50. So what ESP4 GRO receive does is it calls the same function that we did for the non-GRO path. It ends up calling XFRM input. It does all of, it looks up the um, SPI, finds the SA, does all the checks, decrypts it, and then feeds it back through NAPI into GRO cell receive. And from there we dequeue the packet and send it up through the UDP GRO path. So that's how the uh, UDP GRO path gets handled. So I kind of raced through all of this, and if you have any questions, one thing we can do during the lab is actually trace a packet, and I can show how you can use perf with your OVA and uh, look at all these function stacks later. Right? With that, I'll hand off to Paul, who is going to do the uh, fun interactive stuff. Okay. Um, hi, I'm Paul Wouters. Um, I work for Red Hat. Um, I work on the Libsyn project, which is one of the um, Swan projects. Uh, for those curious, there is uh, in the um, in the slide deck in the end, there's a whole appendix on the history of uh, the various Swans, because I'm sure people are confused about Free Swan, Libsyn, Open Swan, Strong Swan. Um, so you'll find a bit of history there. Um, uh, and there's there's a few more additional slides that I won't be um, going through now. Um, so, so I won't talk about the IPsec part um, that's been talked about, um, although I'll mention one thing. Um, since, of course, in home networks, uh, the only thing that you can reliably get out of your network is TCP or UDP, um, there's a mode called ESP and UDP, where we basically encapsulate that ESP packet into a UDP packet to send it out. And then there's, a, there's an encapsulation and decapsulation function for that. Um, and the ITF is currently also um, working on doing this for TCP, um, which of course is horrible because you'll you'll end up running encrypted TCP inside TCP, and you get like retransmission layers fighting. But it's sort of a, a you know, um, if the network is also dropping UDP, this is the only way to get out of the network. So the, there's a there's a specification for that that basically says like do this as a as a last resort, and while you're doing it, try to go back as soon as possible to either plain ESP or U, or ESP and UDP. Um, so I guess the command channel, um, it does peer authentication, parameter negotiation, it generates a secret key, so, so basically the, the two endpoints uh, agree on uh, the same uh, seed, called um, uh, SK seed, and then they'll use a, a negotiated PRF, and then they'll, they can just generate a, a, an unlimited key stream of, of pseudo-random numbers uh, that they'll use as actual symmetric keys later on for the, uh, for the packet encryption. The Ike protocol itself is also encrypted, so um, sometimes that's a little confusing. So we'll first send up an encrypted Ike session to then negotiate encryption keys and send them uh, and, and, and agree on them, and then we'll actually start doing packet encryption, which is you know just the kernel's job. As, as we said, there's SPD uh, policies and, and uh, security association uh, database at the states. So uh, um, the user land mostly handles the policies. Um, we just enter the, the right policies into the kernel, and either we never have to do anything again because it's an IPsec tunnel um, or an IPsec connection and, and all, uh, the kernel is doing all the work, or it is just a policy that says, hey, if you ever happen to see a packet for this destination, then give me a signal and uh, through the acquire, um, through the Netlink socket, we, we get that information. Um, there's a bunch of RFCs. Um, just, just to know, this has been around for a long time. So Ike version one was from 1998. Um, um, I wasn't very um, active in the TLS working group, so I was really surprised when I heard that TLS 1.3 was the first 
TLS algorithm, first TLS protocol, where we would actually do ephemeral key exchanges uh, as mandatory. This has been mandatory since 1998 in Ike. There's no uh, there's no non-ephemeral way of doing this. Like we always said, like you must have perfect forward secrecy. Like we always first do a Diffie-Hellman and then do other things. Like I was actually quite shocked that in TLS 1.2, or like you could still have a static key. Someone can sniff all the traffic, and 10 years down the line, when they happen to get the private key, they can decrypt everything. That was really surprising for me. Um, but to be fair, um, um, the Ike version one has been uh, has learned a lot from the old SSL layers. And you know, when when SSL 1.0 came out, when Ike v1 came out, um, the TLS people learned again from Ike v1, so they came up with you know TLS 1.0, 1.1, and now it's, it's going again. So TLS 1.3 now has learned from Ike v2. So so we're sort of in step, looking at each other, what we're doing, and as the you know one makes sense for a single net flow, the other makes sense for you know an entire IP range or. or um, if you've heard any, at any point that you know this is highly insecure, what you've really heard about is the Ike v1 aggressive mode. And it's not that the protocol is insecure, the protocol is actually not broken. It is just that people pick really weak pre-shared keys and that in combination with aggressive mode where you can do offline uh, dictionary based attacks, it becomes a weak point. So whatever you configure, if you're still, if you're still stuck with the old Ike v1 protocol, try to stick with main mode, do not do aggressive mode. Um, for Ike v2, that has all been changed, so there's only really one sort of mode. It's called uh, uh, the initial exchanges. Um, the, uh, and, and the one thing to note is that in uh, both in Ike v1 aggressive mode and in Ike v2, to sort of speed up the, 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 the lookups, the, um, the identity of the responder can be revealed in a message. So normally that's not a problem because like if you are a VPN client and you're going to connect to your VPN server, well, that VPN server is known anyway to be a server. It's sort of publicly known. It's available in the DNS. It has an IP address. It's known. So people already kind of know that uh, that server is out there. So it's not considered much of a secret. Uh, and by sending that ID, um, it does give you more abilities too. So the server can can assume an identity and, and they can look up different pre-shared keys for different connections. And so, um, so it was sort of a, um, a compromise. Like they said, like, well, in in a, in a passive attack, it's almost always already known. And if someone would do an active attack, so even if you would first do a Diffie-Hellman and only then you send the ID, well, someone, either the client or the server, has to start out anyway with revealing who they think they're talking to. So even an active attacker could still actually get that ID. So so that's why it was considered not a big problem to, to leak on the wire. So what's the general mechanism? We first do a Diffie-Hellman key exchange, so we get a private channel. We, we at least know that we're talking to one entity, not many. And then, of course, the next step is to authenticate that, uh, that entity. Um, this can be a mutual authentication. Uh, Ike v1 was always a mutual authentication and always also symmetrical based on the same algorithm. So if you did RSA authentication one way, you did RSA authentication the other way. With Ike v2, you can do different methods. So one could, like one client could, could use a pre-shared key and the server could use um, a certificate. Uh, you see that a lot these days with the EAP um, because it, it, it allows the client not to install any certificates uh, themselves. Um, then we uh, negotiate various things, uh, net detection, that peer detection, session resumption, a bunch of sort of features that can be enabled depending on, on the session. I won't go into too many details. There's like um, about 20 different RFCs that have different Ike v2 features. Um, but if you have any interest in some specific uh, thing, then, um, then let me know. Um, and finally, once the, 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 the peers have authenticated each other, they're actually going to negotiate the IPsec parameters. And that's like, you know, what are we going to encrypt? How are we going to encrypt it? And which packets are we going to allow? What mode we're going to use, um, et cetera. So as I said, um, Ike v1, um, please try to avoid it. Um, if there's any Android developers in the room, I always like to point them out that they still really don't do Ike v2. Please hurry up. You're the last ones there. Please do Ike v2. <laughs> um, Ike v1 uh, has a, a few older algorithms, uh, so there's still triple deaths around that people use. Uh, you can use Ike v2, but obviously people don't do it anymore. Um, again, none of these algorithms really have been broken, even HMAC MD5 and HMAC SHA1. Um, they're not as broken as the, the non HMAC version, so, th so they're still actually safe. The only thing that has been really broken is um, the Diffie Helmut Group 1, which is Modp768. 
um, which was actually not implemented by all the swans since 1998. So actually the only mode that you can now brute force really uh, um, was never implemented. Mod P1024, which is group two, is getting to the point where we think, you know, NSA and nation states can probably decrypt it, but uh, academia cannot yet uh, do it. Um, there's again one weird exception of a special group that uses um, a different uh, subprime ordering, and that one um, can probably be broken, and which is why we've um, explicitly removed it in one of the, uh, what is it, RFC 8221 uh, a couple of months ago. So IQV2, we learned a few things. We needed that peer detection. Um, uh, we needed the, the, the net traversal. In IQV1, when IQV1 was, was designed, uh, we were still hopeful that IPv6 would take over. We would never see net again in our lifetimes. We were all really happy, optimistic. Um, uh, we decided now that you know it's, it's, it's never going to go away, so, so we need proper net traversal handling. Um, IQV2 is actually used in many ways under the hood. Um, it will be used for the new 5G standards for everything. Um, voice over LTE, Wi-Fi calling, if you have that enabled on your phone, you're actually doing IGV2 and IPsec connections to make that happen. Um, the Xbox One, if you're gaming, also uses IPsec. Um, um, there's a few less round trips in IGV2, so it's, it, it's faster to establish. If you, uh, if you use it on a phone, you can actually tell the difference um, because it's like two round trips less uh, compared to IGV1, so it's actually nicer. Um, it defaults to modern crypto suites, uh, GCM, ChaCha20, Poly, uh, Curve2519, um, and a CCM mostly for IoT devices. They're really, um, uh, on IoT, they really like to prefer to do a little more work on the CPU if that saves them sending out a byte over the, um, the wireless connections. Uh, so there's a, a few different considerations on which algorithms to use there. Uh, another important thing to, uh, that was not part of IQV2 originally and was sort of added on in a, in a not best way um, is fragmentation support. Because you're, uh, especially in tunnel mode, when you're putting a packet inside another packet, you're going to run into a smaller MTU issue or, you know, or a large MTU issue. So if you're putting a 1500 byte packet inside another packet, that packet is going to be bigger than 1500 bytes and then you have to fragment it. Um, so that's one thing you need to support. Um, and then on the other side is the during the ICE negotiation itself, if you're using X509 certificates and you're sending certificates along, then uh, that also can actually uh, go across the 1500 uh, MTU issue, and then you actually you, you can't negotiate. So um, in the ideal world, fragments get sent over the network, it gets reassembled on the other side, and there's no problems. But in practice, it means that fragments get dropped, especially on LTE networks. Uh, things don't work. Um, and so in IKE v2, there's, an, there's a fragmentation support, and it's a little better than IKE v1. In IKE v2, the f each individual fragments get encrypted. So let's say you're sending five fragments. If the other side didn't get all of them, they can ask again, um, but they don't need the ones that they already have because they are already protected uh, by the encryption and the integrity check. So, so it's harder for a DDoS attack to happen where they just send, you know, malicious bad uh, fragments and you just keep them, but you can't authenticate them unless you've got all of them, and so they only needed to spoof one of the fragments. Um, with IQV2, uh, because it's signed per fragment, they actually have to, you know, they have to block all the fragments from receiving you, even on retransmits. So it's a bit more secure. Um, funny enough, IQV1 was a little more secure in, uh, with the pre-shared key mode that it, it, it gave us a, a post-quantum uh, protection. Um, the disadvantage, why it was removed, was that um, if you did the Ike authentication with the pre-shared key, the pre-shared key was mixed into the generation of the shared secret, which meant if you didn't have the right uh, pre-shared key, you would just get an unencryptable blob of text and you, you couldn't do anything. So you couldn't actually know what went wrong, you could just you know, assume that you had the wrong pre-shared key. Um, with IQV2, they changed it slightly. They put the auth uh, payload in a separate um, uh, in a separate payload, so that if you got the authentication wrong with the wrong pre-shared key, you would just you would still be able to decrypt the packet and then read and set authentication failed. You, you still might not be able to trust it because you didn't authenticate, but at least you know more about what's going on. So you could do retransmit, so you could decide to to get a confirmation somehow. But that because of that, we lost the, the protection against the, the quantum computers. So we added a new 
post-quantum pre-shared key, which is basically sort of similar to the IGV1 pre-shared key, as an additional thing that you can do. So you can do certificate-based authentication and add this, you know, out-of-band uh, shared uh, pre-shared key uh, to protect yourself against um, quantum computers. Um, and this is sort of a stopgap measure until, you know, the um, CFRG, the, the Crypto Forum Research Group at IETF has come with, you know, the proper um, post-quantum algorithms that we can trust. Um, more retransmission. There's a better protection against DDoS attacks. Um, the retransmissions in IGV1 is really bad. Like any 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 endpoint decided independently when to retransmit packets, so they all would go back and forth and would amplify. Like you could send one spoofed packet to an IG server anywhere on the internet, and it would like retransmit 20 times, and so you would get this amplification uh, for a DDoS attack. So in IGV2, it's, it's, it's been cleaned up a little bit. So uh, retransmission only happens by the initiator. So uh, the responder just sends a packet, uh, and it's not the responder's responsibility to retransmit. Um, OK, and so that all sounds really complicated. And people always think it's really complicated to configure. So now we're going to show you how easy it actually is to configure. Um, so any, any questions so far on the theory? Because this is all the theory we're going to do. Now it's all practice. Okay, good. So first, a typical uh, VPN, host to host, no nets in between. We got one IP on the left, one IP on the right, and we wanted to send crypto traffic. First thing you want to do is you like each each host needs an identity. And this is actually one of the the hardest parts because if you got a cloud with ten thousand machines, how do you give them an identity? How do you know that's there? Um, often. We have customers that say, well, um, I guess that's a real machine because someone with the AWS console password launched this node, so therefore it must actually be a real node because an attacker couldn't do that. But they don't have any finer control of how to prove that that's not a, you know, an illegitimate node on the network. So um, the simplest way for, uh, for a host-to-host -host connection where you don't need third parties to sort of negotiate uh, the ID is to use raw keys. Um, so if you um, if anyone has installed their uh, have a VM and they have Libreson on it, uh, you can type ipsec new host key as root, and you'll see it generates just a raw key. Um, we were hoping originally in the late 90s that uh, we could uh, not use certificates and that X509 would also be one of those technologies that would be happily die and be replaced by something better. Um, so we were hoping raw keys would, would be better. Um, it's not as popular. So, so raw keys is sort of only used in the, um, in the IPsec world still. Um, everybody else has just switched to certificates, either self-signed certificates or, or you know, as, as an equivalent of, of a raw key. Uh, but we can use straight raw keys. So if you use IPsec show host key dash list, uh, dash dash list, it will show you all the ones you have generated. Um, and if you want to have the public key uh, that you can give to your your uh, your other host to, to configure, you can use IPsec show host key dash dash left or dash dash right. And then the CK ID that uh, the list command shows you. Um, I can actually briefly show that, I guess. I'll just switch. Um, the font is readable, right? It's big enough. There we go. And I can do show host key dash dash left. And I'll So that's the public key. So this is the, the item that I give to the other administrator of the other host, um, and they can configure that. And they will similarly do that on their machine and give it to me. So now we have a raw public key. If you want to do certificates, um, the easiest way to do is just to get a PKCS12 uh, certificate, which means you have a, uh, the CA, the root CA certificate, or and, and the in intermediate CA certificates, um, plus your end certificate, plus the private key. Um, and I will I'll, I'll show it later when we get to the example of uh, using the remote access VPN um, with, a, with the certificates. You can use the IPsec import command, which is really a wrapper around the, the, the cert util command that comes with the NSS library. Um, Libreson uses the NSS library as the crypto library. It's like, you know, it's FIP certified. It's been around for a while. It's the same library that Firefox uses. Um, that's, that's our basic uh, crypto. So, so 
so in fact it's funny that Librisfan almost has no crypto in itself in its code like um, there's very minimal things it's actually only technically speaking for FIP certification the only thing we need to certify is the key derivation function uh, that's used in Ike because it's slightly different from the standard functions. Everything else is actually all subbed out to the NSS library. They have to do all the FIP certification oh. for us and we're just a happy consumer. Um, so even though we're considered like a cryptographic package, we actually hardly have any crypto in there. Um, the third way, uh, that's, uh, even though it's the most common way of configuring things, is the pre-shared key. Um, this is the only line you'll see about it. Um, don't use pre-shared keys, they're not very secure. Um, you will get your administrator with an easy to remember pronounced uh, word on the phone, it will not be secure. Some of them won't be able to input hex characters, or so, so you only get ASCII, so it's actually not even fully random, it's only a really small subset of characters. Um, don't use pre-shared keys if you can help it. So I will never mention them from here on again. So um, both sides have generated this public key, you've exchanged them, and uh, now you put in uh, what you call a connection. So to, um, uh, to come back a little bit on, on Somini's uh, transport mode versus tunnel mode, and we call everything a tunnel, we actually call everything a connection. <laughs> and a connection could be a tunnel or a transport mode thing. Um, so you can see um, that um, you'll see a lot of left and right mentioned. So we thought, again, back in the 90s, that this was a really clever idea. Um, instead of talking about source and destination, because IPsec is a peer-to-peer -peer protocol, you don't really have a source and a destination. You don't really have a client and a server. They're all equal partners in this. So we decided to call it left and right. So what's on the left side of your diagram on paper and what's on the right side of your diagram on paper? And of course, if you turn around the paper, it still works. It's just, you know, the other side is left or right. So in fact, you can take this configuration um, uh, in general and put it on the other machine and it will still work because it's the same configuration and the, the endpoints will figure out whether they are left or right. So for instance, in this case, you see the right is the, their uh, IP or host name. So when the daemon starts, it will look like, am I this IP address? If I cannot find this IP address, then I must not be right, then I must be left. So the nice thing is that, that for almost all configurations, you can actually use the exact same configuration on both sides. So you don't have to write different configurations for the different uh, endpoints. So what do we have? Like the minimum information, left equals percent default route means that you don't have to put in your own IP address. It will just pick up the whatever IP address Linux will use to send packets over the default route. Left ID, you can make up whatever you want. This is just a host-to-host -host connection. You're just using it for identification purposes uh, because you're actually really using the public key. So um, the syntax here is if it starts with an at symbol, it means it's a string you should not resolve. So it's just your own custom string. You can, I use my name, you can use whatever you want there. Then you paste in that line you got from the IPsec new host key command. Um, then right, you put the IP address. You, again, you make up the idea that you want. Authorize RSA sick is the default mode. I didn't put it in. You can actually leave that line out because it's the default. Um, but at some point, we'll, we'll probably soon change to like ECDSA as a, as a default there. Um, and then you've got the auto line. Um, uh, you can do auto equals start, on demand, or add. Start means load the connection and bring it up. On demand means load the connection and whenever there's a packet, the kernel will tell us and then we'll bring it up. And add means never bring it up, just wait for the other end to respond to you. Ike V2s insist, um, it's also, uh, it's still needed for now. Um, by the time we'll hit rel 8, we have changed the default that Ike V2 will be the default and you have to actually go through um, enabling Ike V1 if you want to. So for now, Ike V1 is still the default because it's been default for so long, but for rel 8, we'll actually switch it. And this is it, this is the entire configuration. And like, like it doesn't matter what VPN protocol you use, right? You need to say, who, which IP you want to encrypt to, what your, what your public key is, and, 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 and start it. So, so IPsec is not this hard. You've now set up an IPsec tunnel. This is, this is it. Um, we were hoping to do this between neighboring laptops here between yourselves, but unfortunately the Wi-Fi here doesn't allow you to connect and send packets to your neighbor. Um, we have some VMs that, uh, that are running in Amsterdam that we can use uh, later on if people want to wanna play with it. Um, we do have some, I do have a tutorial uh, a little bit further down in this deck where we actually connect to a remote access VPN in Amsterdam so that everybody can use because from Wi-Fi you can go to the outside world. 
So how does this look like? Um, the service is called IPsec, so you enable the service, you start the service. Um, if you haven't added a, an auto equals line, then you can, um, or if you just added the config file but the demo is already running, you can manually add the connection by, saving, by typing IPsec auto dash dash add. You see the connection is being added, and then you can do dash dash up to um, show it up. And um, I cut a little bit of input from the slide. If you'll do this, you'll see a few more extra lines. The last line you'll see in this case, um, this was not entirely the same as the previous slide because you can see that it says IPsec uh, established tunnel mode, ESP slash NAT, so it actually detected NAT detection because it's actually a different example. You see the two spine numbers. Um, so the spine number for the lookup uh, that Samini talked about is actually per direction. So you have one spy for the incoming part and one spy for the outgoing part. Um, so it tells you these, tells you the transform used in this case was ASGCM. Uh, none refers to the integrity algorithm. So uh, in the older days, we had an encryption and an integrity algorithm. So you had like uh, triple dash SHA-1 or AES-CBC SHA-2. But the modern ones, we have the AADs, the, the combinatory algorithms that do it all at once. So GCM, uh, cha cha 20, poly 13 5 it's one pass. So you see this none as in there's no separate authentication or integrity algorithm. And there's some net information for net detection, and it says DPD is active. So I'll, I'll, I'll briefly talk about DPD. So dead peer detection um, is like one of those typical foot bullets. Like when you think it's, it's working for you, it can also work against you. So the idea is that um, tunnels can be idle, and if they're idle, it's fine. Uh, but if you want to make sure that the other side is still there, you can send a DPD packet. So it's basically a ping over the Ike protocol, and you get an answer back saying, you know, pong. Um, but of course, people tend to enable this in way too too common. So like they go like, oh, we do financial transactions. This tunnel cannot be down for 10 seconds, so we'll send one of these packets every five seconds. Well, the problem is, if you send these probes and your tunnel is already flaky, and by just sending more packets, you're just going to have more packet loss, and so you, your tunnel is actually going to more quickly die because the DPD will say, oh, well, this, this endpoint is not here because we just lost three packets on the three probes we sent. So that's why, why internally we call these DPDs, we actually call them make deaths because they often they, uh, they, they cause more harm than they do good. Um, where they are useful is, is when you have a remote access VPN, and so, you know, somebody opens their phone and their laptop, they connect to the VPN, and then whenever they lose their connectivity, the laptop closes and they didn't get a, a shutdown signal. And now you're holding on to this connection for eight hours or 24 hours. So in that sense, from the server side, it's useful to, you know, maybe in half an hour, maybe in an hour, say, is the other, is the other party still there or not? Um, but then, of course, there's also additional problems because, um, that laptop or phone is likely behind NAT, and so if the NAT mapping is gone, you actually lose your connection too. So there's also a NAT keep alive that so the client actually sends for that. Um, so, so, so the basics are, are, are simple, but you know when you get into real networks and you run into all these corner cases. Um, and also, uh, there's a bunch of implementations that did the DPD wrong. So when you are receiving traffic from the other side, you're supposed to never send a DPD because you know that they're there. But of course, that is IPsec traffic that goes into the kernel, not, and so the user land doesn't really know about this. And so some implementations just send DPDs anyway because, you know, well, why not? We don't, the user land doesn't know if they're there or not. So, so then... Um, so then it becomes a really noisy link. So even if you don't send any traffic, you, you continue to see these DPD packets going back and forth. Um, so so um, we, we always try to make the defaults really useful. So um, in general, don't set any options you, you're not really familiar with with exactly what they do, or if you haven't read something where you spe specifically have to enable it. Um, we really do our best to make the defaults sane for everyone. Okay, so how can you see that the tunnel's actually up? Um, the easiest way um, is to use IPsec WAC dash dash traffic status. It will just give you a really brief summary saying this is your connection, type ESP is encrypted, this is the time uh, it was added to the kernel in um, in Epoch, and uh, and these are the bytes in and out that happened over this connection, uh, and the remote ID is there. And if there's a user password authentication uh, in some modes of Ike, you can have that too. The username is there as well. Um, you can, of course, also look at the, the kernel state, IPX of M state, and IPX of M policy, but you'll get a few screens of, of data you'll have to look through. 
Um, IPsec status, um, it gives you uh, many screens of information. Um, it used to be the internal developer only status dump of the daemon and then people started using it and so it slowly turned into an API and now we're sort of committed to it. Um, I apologize for the uh, for the format uh, inconsistencies all over the output. Please don't use it if you cannot uh, if you can avoid it. We promise you'll make something nice debuzz soon. Um, you can also use TCP dump. Um, this is the most common line. Remember that uh, you mostly you're looking at ESP packets, but if you're also looking at the the Ike packets and um, that's port 500 and 4500. Uh, and if you're doing um, ESP encapsulated in UDP, that also goes over port 4500 UDP. So this line catches all of that. Um, so the Ike protocol runs on port 500. Um, so in the early 2000s when NAT were uh, coming around and, and never going away again, um, people were trying to be helpful for IPsec nodes behind NAT. So they did some extra manipulation of the, of the packet. They would rewrite IP addresses. In the end, it just screwed things up more than it helped. So um, what happens now is that um, Ike actually, when it detects that there is NAT involved, it just moves to a different port so that all those old helper implementations that are out there do not mess with our packets anymore. Um, so that's why, why Ike is actually on both port 500 and 4500. You are now allowed, since Ike v2, you're allowed to just start on port 4500 and just forget about 500. It's an artifact of the past. And, uh, so this is how, how it looks like. Um, it was already shown before. Um, so I'll just go over this. So what is a side-to-side -side VPN? It's basically two gateways, and they both have a subnet behind it, and you want to connect them. So is that? Now so much harder. No, it's exactly it's the exact same thing as a host-host connection, except there's two new lines here: left subnet equals whatever, and right subnet equals whatever, and that's it. So host-to-host -host and site-to-site -site are the exact same simple configuration. Um, if you want more than one subnet, you can define them with the left subnets and right subnets keyword. Um, of course, for those who want to mix v4 and v6, yeah, you do have to split up two connections. I'm sorry. Um, because they, they, these are either in v4 or v6 mode, so you have to uh, create two connections then. And the same for if you do 4 and 6 or 6 and 4, you have to separate them out. So typical remote access network. Um, you know, it's our phone, our laptop, we want a VPN, we don't trust the local Wi-Fi, we just want a VPN to a trusted place and we want to uh, send all the traffic from there. Um, and the VPN server can either give you a private or a public IP address. If it gives you a private one, it will NAT it and send it out. So we, I just had a, a, did a, 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 um, a test server for this, so we can actually use that. So um, feel free to go to uh, netdev.noads.ca. Um, you'll see a link where there's a bunch of PKCS 12 certificates. Feel free to download one. Um, the password is foobar on it because the, it has to have a password for the private key. Um, so this is how, how a connection like that would, work, would, uh, would look like. Um, it's again left this percentage default route. In this case, we don't specify or make up our own ID. We just say take it from the certificate. So left ID is percentage from cert. Um, for the RSA key, we basically say take it from the cert as well. Um, it's a default option. I just put it in here for clarification, but you normally don't have to specify it. Left mode CFG client is yes. It's basically saying, yes, I know I'm a client and the server can give me some configuration information. So like uh, domain name, DNS, uh, login banner that your lawyers insist are on the server, uh, all these things you can configure. Again, uh, for write and write ID, um, usually for, for machines uh, publicly on the internet, we don't use the certificate CN entry at all. We just use a subject alt name that actually has a fully qualified domain name in it. Um, so then you tend to specify that as well as the right ID. Um, that allows you, by not using also not using the IP address, you can have multiple servers with the same identity and you know, clients can pick a different server depending on their DNS lookups. Um, narrowing is yes, uh, means that um, in, since IKE v2, what you can actually do is you can ask for tunnel 00 to 00, and then the server will tell you, well, I'm not willing to give that, but I'll give you 1234 to 0 slash 0. And then that becomes your IP address. 
So it's a, it's a it's a way of basically sending a, 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 a one or more IP addresses, and and you can actually do this multiple times. So if you've got multiple site to site VPNs, you can also have them narrowed down. So you can you can configure one connection that covers your one site, your one subnet, the other subnet, but then you can negotiate separate IPsec tunnels for each IP flow if you wanted to, um, using narrowing. Um, mobile ICAS, yes, um, that allows us to change the uh, the transport point. So we have the gateways and we've got the subnets behind it, but sometimes when you're on LTE, you switch to Wi-Fi or vice versa, your IP address changes. You don't want to tear down a tunnel and start a new one. So what you can actually tell um, the other end is, hey, I'm now switched. Uh, you know, um, So like when your iPhone or your, your Android phone goes to sleep and it wakes up, it will send one of these Ike probes that says, hey, um, I'm here now. Um, maybe the net mapping has changed. Maybe my IP address has changed. But this is my new uh, public IP address that you can reach me on. And then the server will update that. And so any any further packets over the IPsec tunnel will actually be sent to that uh, to that new IP address. So this is sort of you know making roaming much more easier. Um, so this configuration file is also on a test server. So you can just grab a copy, change the left cert entry to the certificate you grabbed as well. And then um, you can try it out. Um, if you run it, IPsec auto dash dash up, you'll see something like this. You'll see you get a IP address in a range of 100.64. Um, I tend to use that range uh, myself. I guess I shouldn't have shared that secret because now everybody will start using this. Uh, but normally, if you if you have like 10 slash 8 on, on your VPN server that you hand out addresses from, but your local Wi-Fi where your client is on is also on 10 slash 8, you get this weird thing like, are you sure where you know 10.1.1.1 lives? Is it locally at your Wi-Fi, or does it happen to be the mail server on the other side of your VPN tunnel? Um, if you pick 100.64, it's typically used. Uh, it's it's actually the range for carrier grade NAT, which is never ever supposed to be visible to you as an endpoint. So you're free to use it, and it should never clash. Um, so we can um, go back to doing that. Um, just for the curious, this is the server side version of that same connection. Um, you'll see in this case, I use left for the server side. Uh, the subnet is 0 slash 0. The right is an address pool, so there's an address pool where I uh, where we where we pull up addresses from, and we send two name servers and we send two domains, uh, and we use Mobike as well. You can see that it says auto equals add because we don't we cannot initiate right. We don't know where your roaming devices are, so we'll just wait for them to to connect to us. And rekey is no means also because we don't want to initiate two other IP addresses where they, the the client might no longer be. We say Riki is no, it's up to the client to say, yeah, I'm still here, I want to renew my tunnel. So do people want to try this out themselves now, or do you feel like you still want to listen more uh, to other types of configurations? OK. You can do this on the background while I talk about other things if you want. Um, so, so what we really uh, liked as, as, as the, the original FreeSound project, that's not a LibreSound project, is opportunistic IPsec. We had this goal of encrypting the entire internet with IPsec so that you know, we wouldn't run into all this plain text everywhere. Um, but of course, it's also useful, useful for the enterprise network. You want to do a mesh network encryption, like especially after the whole Snowden um, debacles of where they're stripping things out. And you know, it turns out your, your MPLS connections, even though they're private and should be secure, people have access to it. So you can either build these giant IPsec gateways where you connect one site to another site, and if these sites are really big, then um, you have to have really, really powerful machines. So a much nicer way of doing this would be to just have all your nodes do encryption to all your other nodes in a mesh. Um, but of course, you don't want, if you have a thousand nodes, you don't want to, when you add the you know, thousand and first node, you don't want to have to change a thousand nodes configuration to talk to these things. So you want to have one configuration that works, and whenever you add a node, you know, it will automatically work inside that, uh, inside that mesh encryption. Um, so you can do that based on x certificates. You can do it based on public keys, those raw public keys, by placing them in DNSSEC. Um, and they can be triggered either by, uh, by a packet, like we, we talked about before, and they can also be triggered by DNS lookup. We have a, a neat way that I'll talk about in a second. Um, you can also use Let's Encrypt Certificate if you want. 
Um, in this case, for, um, uh, for the enterprise encryption, you want mutual authentication because you actually will only want authenticated encryption. If you want to do this sort of internet-wide, then you know, just like TLS, you, the client really doesn't want to say who they are. They just want to be, remain anonymous. Um, so they can, they can do a null authentication. So how does this look like? If you see, if you install LibreSign, you'll see this etc ipsec.d policies directory. Um, and they contain uh, network IP ranges in CIDR notation. So in this case, you can say, you can see that there's a connection called, um, uh, there's a group called private or clear, which has these two ranges that uh, are, uh, that are uh, mine in Amsterdam. Um, and private or clear means you can try and talk IPsec to them, but if for some reason that host doesn't know how to do IPsec, you can just do clear text uh, to them. We'll fall back to clear text. But you know, if you want to do this enterprise style, you can use the, the private policy, which means don't ever fall back to clear text. We, we demand encryption here. If there's no encryption, we don't want you to uh, send clear text traffic. So you put all the ranges that you want in there. And you can put zero slash zero in there too if you're adventurous. Um, so how does it look like? So those, those, those group names, private, private, clear, clear, or private, those are um, actually just connections in our configuration file. So you see here an example here, it's using certificate. It's using, again, left as default route, get the ID from certificate. The only new line you see here is that there's um, right equals percentage opportunistic group, which is its way of saying, oh, I have to match the, um, I have to see if the IP address comes from this group, and if it is, then I'll fill in the IP address here. Um, so this one is, uh, because this one uh, is the private group and we don't want to leak anything, what we say is fill your shunt is dropped. So if this connection fails to establish, drop all the packets. And negotiation shunt is hold means that, um, so when the, the kernel receives the first packet, there might also be more packets. What do you do with those packets while the tunnel is being set up? Um, so you can choose to either let them go out in the clear or you can decide to hold on to them and only when a tunnel is up to send them out. And hold on to them is not really entirely fair because if it's a UDP packet, it will just get dropped because it's assumed that the application will do the retransmission. For TCP, since that takes way too long, the kernel actually does a little extra work and, and holds on to the TCP packet. And so once the tunnel is up, it, it gets a signal and it sends out that previously held TCP packet. So this is the private or clear one, so the only difference is the failure shunt is passed through and the negotiation shunt is passed through. Um, and then this is, the, um, this is the version where we're putting the keys not in certificates, but this is the one we can do um, network wise. So this is the one on your VM you could configure and you could do this to, uh, to servers uh, that support this. So, oe.libreson.org is one of these servers that has supported this. So you can grab this configuration file, install it. Um, and if you have Unbound, um, it's a DNS server um, that actually has hooks in it. So it has an IPsec module. So, um, so what we do is when an application like Firefox looks up oe.libreson.org, the Unbound DNS server gets the request instead of only asking for the A and quad A record, it will also ask for an IPsec key record. Um, it will wait with returning the A records to the application until it knows what the answer is to the IPsec key record. If it found an IPsec key record, it will then take the name, the IP addresses, and the public key and gives it to the Ike daemon and says, here, set up a tunnel. It will set up an opportunistic tunnel to, uh, to the remote endpoint. And when it's done, it will signal that, yeah, all's clear, tunnel is in place. At that point, the DNS server will return the A records and the quad A records to the application, put them in a local cache. Firefox gets them. Firefox sent a clear text packet, but now it's already encrypted by IPsec. Um, so that's also a demo server that's available uh, for us to try. And the, uh, the configuration files are that are also on the NetDev server. Um, there's a little trick here because there's NAT involved, and, I, uh, and um, uh, if, if since you cannot set up a tunnel to anything but your own IP address, you've got this weird thing where if you're behind NAT, you cannot connect to a public server and take 10.1.1.1 that you happen to be given from the local Wi-Fi because somebody else in another side of the world can also have that IP address. So in the case that NAT is detected um, uh, for the opportunistic IPsec case, the server actually gives you, um, again, uh, an IP address. Um, in this case, you can... Um, 
you can see it's the top entry actually the 100.64.0.2 entry um, it will it will use that for the actual IPsec connection but then it will use the one from your Wi-Fi as an additional um, uh, policy and it will get translated with uh, an IP table rules to match so so it's basically what we're doing is we're doing that inside the IPsec stack uh, just to make sure that you know we we, um, we don't have this problem where you're on a private IP that's used by other people um, and so at that point I say we are ready to do tutorial work um, Um, so, so I also have for for some people. Uh, there's also four servers called netdev one two three four dot noats dot ca with the password netdev zero x twelve. You can log into and play with. Um, but obviously, I don't have uh, a VM device for everyone. Um, so, do people just want to um, test this out themselves? Do people just want to ask questions? Right. So the question is, how does the ESP traffic go out over NAT? So it's encapsulated in a UDP packet. So it's literally just you take the ESP packet, uh, put it as, as payload of a UDP port 4500 packet, and you send it. And the kernel um, detects this, um, strips out the header, then realizes you know, it's just an ESP packet and decrypts it and uh, sends it on into the stack. Yeah. OK. Um, well. In that case, I will. I guess I will do a little demoing of the things, and you can pick up. Um, you can do your own server whenever you want. Um, so this is that congregation I showed, netdev.noas.ca. Um, so what you can do uh, if you go to this server. You'll see there's a pkss12 directory. So if you go there, you can just grab one of these certificates. Um, or if you have an Apple device, um, you can grab one of these mobile configs. That has basically everything configured for you. It comes with a certificate, and it comes with the configuration uh, embedded in it. This is an XML file. Um, you can use that too. And uh, you can grab a copy of the client config here if you want. Um, so I already have this, so if I do, oh, so first let's see what's, what my IP address is. Um, so if, if you play a lot with uh, tunnels and you want to look at the stability of the tunnels, um, one thing that, that really annoyed us is that, um, what, so there's many sites that tell you what your IP address is. So in this case, my IP address is uh, 207.96.2.7.101. Um, but then I would be staring at my phone for the next hour to see if it failed or not. So finally, I wrote a page that just reloads every 10 seconds, and if your IP address changes, it will tell you the timestamp when it changed, and it will tell you the new IP address, so you know when a tunnel fails. So I can just go have a coffee and, and come back an hour later and see that my tunnel failed after 15 minutes. Um, so um, if I add the connection and bring it up, you'll see that there's a little more debugging info here, but if I now go back to this page, then within 10 seconds, Hmm, that's funny, I didn't do it. There's something wrong with my tunnel because it's a demo. I just tried this before all of you guys, people came into the room. Um, probably should just work fine. Yeah, we see packers going through it, so. Um, Ah, there we go. My browser cached it. If it, I did a shift reload and it changed it now, that's weird. So now you see uh, my IP address actually 193.1.10.157.152. That's the one. Um, that's the one from my IP from the the NetApp server. Uh, it's the public IP address of the NetApp server. So even though I have 
I have that 164.13.2 is netted on the server. So if you look on the server, you'll see we just have some, oops. It's just a simple netting rule. It says everything from the from the address pool just not to my own uh, my own uh, IP address. So this is just a remote access server. Um, if you look at the resolve.conf, um, so in, so in this case, it detected I was running the unbound name server, and so it didn't change my resolve.conf. If you're not running your own name server, it will actually. Uh, change, update your resolve.conf based on the name server that the VPN gave you, and when you tear down a tunnel, it will uh, replace the old uh, resolve.conf back. Um, in this case, though, because it detected unbound, um, it detected, and you see here, it, uh, it uh, gave two forwarder rules for my DNS server. It said everything for noads.ca you should send to this IP address and everything for reta.com you should send to those two IP addresses. And when I bring a tunnel down, those entries will be removed again. The cache will be flushed uh, so that old old entries won't conflict. So if you got like, for instance, for Red Hat, we have bugzilla.reta.com. It actually has a public IP address and a private IP address. So once my VPN is up, it goes to the private IP address. Once my VPN is down, because it does a cache flush, the private IP address is flushed, and so it will refetch the public IP address from the public DNS server. So it will still work. OK, so that was one. So now let's do the other test. Let's do the opportunistic encryption. Uh, so I will... We'll just move this one aside. I will move this one in place. And just to show you, I've got like a private or clear one there. Um, my route has been cleaned up. Okay. And let me double check that. My resolve.com points to my local name server so that the trigger will work. And just to check what I have, the private one is empty and the private or clear one, you can see it has, I just put this one server in there for now. Um, and that is the, uh, the server. So um, if I go back here, oh, now it actually detected my IP address changed because I shut down my tunnel. Um, but if I now go to oe.libreson.org, it will tell me just we're not connecting via IPsec. This is also where you can download the configuration files that I'm using right now. So if you want to do this now or later at home, um, you can just grab these configuration files here. There's one for unbound and there's one for um, the, the Libreson. So just to show you what the only specific things in the unbound configuration that are not default is um, you see the module config has the IPsec module loaded. The IPsec module is enabled um, and then it specifies the hook. And so this is the hook that actually communicates between unbound and the uh, Ike daemon. So um, we can also show that there's currently no tunnel up. And so now when I do a lookup for like oe.libreson.org, it, that was fast. It probably did not do what I wanted. Haha. Uh -huh. I love demos. Uh, what happened? Oh, look. We got a shunt route. It basically it failed. So um, let's do a grip, grab of the log. So what probably happened is it failed to actually do this properly. Ah, uh, I know. Yes. Um, so let's. So 
So normally Pluto doesn't allow anyone else to talk to its socket to send uh, to reconfigure itself, um, but now the unbound daemon actually has to configure uh, reconfigure it. So um, we're we're working on adding a proper group and and uh, making this a little more transparent. So now I just gave it access to the um, to to actually bring up the connection. So now we can try this again. Ah, it's taking a little longer now. The DNS failed, but um, that might have just been because we lost the packet. No? We didn't even try it. Now it came from the cache, of course. That's Maybe it's just timed out because it didn't have all the records yet, so I'm just gonna preload the cache a little bit. It's funny. Um, well, um, if if you guys want to work on your remote access VPN, then I can. Um, I will just work on this one for a bit. Um, does anybody have any questions? Okay. Well, if you if you're playing with your VM and if you want to get some help, you can ask either one of us. I'm just now trying to do it manually and sort of bypassing some of it to see where the problem is. So it's still not able to find the key for some reason. Um, so the unbound server hook is not working properly, it looks like. Python error. Oh, I think I... Ah, uh, okay. Let's try this again now.
So it looks like the, the um, Unbound has uh, some additional issues getting data from, probably from the Wi-Fi here. Um. So let's see if we got a, if they made uh, 888 a little more clean than the uh, the raw DNS port 53 <laughs> outwards on this Wi-Fi. There we go. Okay, so so Unbound was just failing to get the the other records before it got to the one that it actually uh, the demo was about. So now you see it actually has set up the. So if I now. Look at the logs again. Um, so it got the queue name here, then it said, oh yes, I found IPsec key records. So let's initiate that. So then it added the, the, the public key to Libreswan, and then it said, told Libreswan to initiate the connection, and then it connected. We got this internal IP address because it detected we are behind NAT, so it's doing this extra layer of NATing. Um, but now if we go back to this page, there's still something wrong. So you see here that we, we have some outbytes, so we're sending traffic, but for some reason we're not getting an answer back because we're getting <coughs> zero invites. Another good way in a while we're, while we're at it, um, checking XFM stat actually um, a good, pre so this basically should show you all zeros. If there's something non-zero, then usually it means you have a problem somewhere. Um, Though, though some of these problems could be ephemeral, like you, the, 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 the state just got deleted or was rekeyed and it mapped the wrong state. But so in this case, it does show that we have some um, XFM problem. So my guess is that our there's some. Oh no, that rule is there. So this is the special rule we needed. Um, So maybe something happened to the other side. Let's see. Uh, I can't connect to it now, so I'll bounce through another machine. So let's see what it thinks. Ooh, and there's three of them. Hmm? Yeah, so they were my previous attempts where it did get the, the negotiation set up, but then I it didn't complete on my end, right? Because I had a misconfiguration on my end with the unbound server. So, so what should happen uh, though, and which is which didn't happen here, is that the older tunnels they should have been. Uh, Oh wait, we're I don't know, we're anonymous. We so it shouldn't it should not have given us the same IP address. So what it's done here is given us the same IP address, but because we used authentication null, it should have actually given us a new IP address because it, it cannot tell the like normal IPsec when you reconnect you reauthenticate and then they can give you the same IP address so all your open connections still work. But in this case it should have actually given a different IP address because I'm authenticating with auth null, so I'm anonymous, so you can't distinguish a second client behind the same net from the same client reconnecting. So I will write that down as a bug. <laughs> but um, oops. So now I restarted the other side, it will just it 
should work now. Um, and just the other one in case. Okay. So. Yes, now it's working. So now it will show. Right, so now it's not doing it over IPsec. So, so clearly we need to polish this up a bit more before everybody enables this by default on their laptops, but <laughs> we're getting there. Okay, so we'll just be around and for... Yeah, if you guys... Or if you, ch if you want to check your email, go check your email. I'll grab a coffee. Feel free to grab me and ask me questions uh, specifically on your setup. Uh, again, I will leave the servers running for a while. So, uh, so the netdev.noas.ca server, I'll leave it running for a couple of weeks. So if you want to try this later at home, feel free to grab one of the certificates and the connection and, uh, and see if it works or not. And if you have any problems, just send me an email. OK, thanks. Uh, Stefan says it, it's uh, the XFMI interface code is already merged into the next tree and will hopefully go into the next uh, upstream version. So, so I'll make this another demo um, to see um, to see if we can um, if it works. So I'll, I have a ping running now, so I'll do a TCP dump. And you'll see, um, if I say ICMP or ESP or UDP or, no, or port 4500, You'll see that it, it will. It, it looks a bit weird because you see this echo replies going in, and it appears to be plain text. Um, so it appears that like the it appears that the the echo sends are getting encrypted, but the the echo replies somehow are coming in plain text. But that's just the weird way of how the hooks uh, for TCP dump in the stack and the hooks for XFM sort of interact with each other. Um, and this confused a lot of people. And this was one of the reasons in the old days before there was the XFM stack, there was the Clips IPsec stack, and it had an interface and it was much nicer. You could either sniff the, the physical interface or you would get the ESP packets or you would sniff the, the virtual interface or you would get the decrypted packets. So it was much cleaner. And you can actually now uh, already almost do that with the VTI and will be even better with the XFMI ones. So I'll just use the static tunnel for now because I'm not entirely sure if this work, the VTI works in combination with our opportunistic and netting rules.
Peek at the man page myself. Beta interface, okay. So you can give this whatever name you want. Um, because the VTI also allows you to uh, basically build an IPsec tunnel from 0, 0 to 0, 0, and then only route that that you want to go across that tunnel, um, you have to say either VTI routing yes or no. So um, for the 0, 0 to 0, 0, you want to say no because you have to um, add the routes manually yourself for only those ranges you want. But in most cases, you want to say routing is yes. So. And we had an option VTI shared because you can actually have multiple tunnels all uh, appear on the same VTI device, but then there's a lot of limitations in the in the code. So um, with the uh, XFMI ones, uh, hopefully this will all be better. And it just made me realize that since we use VTI in the options name, we're going to have a lot of confusing people if we either not rename them to XFMI options or <laughs> so. We'll probably map them to the same thing, and hopefully, uh, because VTI as a term is sort of known outside the Linux world as well, so maybe we need to somehow stick that around too. <laughs> I think this might be broken now. So you see that now there's a dev IPsec zero, and um, this is a common trick we use in all the all the IPsec implementations. If, if you want to build up a tunnel for um, all the traffic, so you get an IP address and then you want to send all the traffic using that new IP address as the source to the destination. So you want to encrypt all your traffic. You have to sort of make sure that you don't implode your tunnel, right? Because if you're sending the encrypted packet, you don't want it to go through the tunnel. Um, so you sort of want a route set with the proper parameters, but you want that route to be more important than the default route. So basically you split it in two. You, you pick 0 slash 1 and here 128 slash 1, and you pick your route. So now you've you basically covered the entire default route, but in two half routes, and now it becomes more specific, so it gets preferred. So you don't have to like do weird things like delete your default route or something. Um, but let's see what's going on. Um, because this should just work, so we'll leave the ping running. Let's see what happens at the... Ah, it's okay. Um, that all seems to be other things. So what's happening on our device here. So we see that all this is all the plain text traffic going out. But we don't see anything coming back in. That is unchanged, so nothing happened there. <coughs> Did we get the appearance got configured? Did, let's let's do a manual test. Huh? That shouldn't have made a difference, but... It almost looks like forwarding isn't working or something. Uh, <coughs> hmm. Anyway, what, what I mostly wanted to show you was actually the... Um, the configuration to do this marking, and this, so now you by, by just changing the route, um, you decide which of these two to because you can have um, um, the same exact same tunnel but with a different mark, and so you can install two of the exact same SPD policies into the kernel, and based on the mark, based on the routing, you can set. So as soon as one of these routes, usually you'll have one that you prefer, which is your whatever your cheaper or your faster one. And then when that one goes down, and you can do that with the, the DPD detection, so when that tunnel goes down, 
you then take down the route automatically and then the route defaults back onto the other one um, and will then send packets to that one. And then when, once the tunnel comes back in, the reverse happens. Sometimes the packets vanishing is uh, is a little hard to diagnose. Uh. <laughs> and I'll, I'll show you the already sledgehammer approach I have in my sysctl.conf. Um, um, so I log all the Martians, so at least I know when, when the kernel is unhappy. Um, I enable forwarding for everything. Uh, then I hate RP filter with a, with a passion, so I just disable it everywhere <laughs> and depend on people to, you know, do their proper firewalling themselves. Um, traditionally, so RP filter is basically the mechanism that says if I receive a packet over one interface um, and I would send it out over the same interface, then something must be wrong and maybe I should send, like, maybe I should do something, uh, either drop the packet or send a redirect or something. Um, and it didn't always, I'm not sure if it's still the case, it didn't always take into account, for instance, if you uh, a common setup was where you you are at home, you have a DSL server, a DSL connection, and you have a VPN tunnel, and then so you receive the encrypted packet, you decrypt it, but since you only have one interface, you only your your one Ethernet, it will send it out the same Ethernet, and then RP filter would go like, oh, there must be a better way of doing this because the packet comes from the same interface as where it's going to, so it would send all these like redirects or. or so I always I always disable all the redirects and and disable all the RP filter and just so that I am in control of, of exactly when to drop the packets or not. Um, this, is, uh, this is just unrelated other playing I did. Um, sure. Stefan, do you have any idea what might be wrong now? Or It might be that I have a funky kernel because I've like done weird stain things too. But. Yeah, that, it, it seems the the outbytes isn't going up, so it seems that the stack isn't actually even receiving them anymore. Uh, I don't know. I'll have to look into that. That's right. So what do you want me to do? Minus I? Minus capital I. Then I want something else. No. <laughs> I guess technically we're not allowed to use the netstat command anymore for ten years, but. <laughs> Are we allowed to use the IF config command? <laughs> but I like the layout of it so much better. We should have an IP command wrapper that just lays it out like if config. Um, that would just be the so so IP get um, so 
So it's using that that sort that IP address we got from the server. No, only the fifteen that were there before. <laughs> Yes, this is when you file a bugzilla with Red Hat. Like. <laughs> it might be, I think I, this is a pretty old kernel probably. No, ah, not too old actually. <laughs> Let's see if I can do a slightly different demo then. Uh, so this is how we run test cases on Libra Swan. Um, I'll just pick one that has VTI. Um, what does this do? Basic test case. With a zero to zero VPN and routing. Okay, so let's see if that still works. So the way we do test casing, we actually install KVM images. So we, we have images called East, West, North, and South. Um, and there's an init script for them that sort of sets them up. So we do some basic things. And then there's a run script that's run, that actually runs some tests. And we capture the output and then we diff it against the known output. So I will actually just run a test case and see what happens. <laughs> This was also the reason you saw like 10 networks configured on my laptop. Uh, these are actually the, uh, the, the test ranges that we use so that I can also SSH into all these test machines. You can see running KVM uh, test is fairly slow. Um, it's a little slower than it normally is, but like a full test run we have of about 600 test cases takes about eight to 10 hours. <laughs> So you see here that um, we put a firewall block in place and then do a ping to confirm that the network is blocked because that's the easiest way for us to confirm later on that the test works or not. So then it sets up the tunnel. It pings again, so it should drop the packets here because we didn't add the route yet. Then we add the route and we send another ping. So now if you look at what happened on the console of the machine, we see we blocked the route, the ping packets dropped, we brought up the connection. Um, the packets still got dropped because we didn't add the route. Then we added, so this is one where it sets up the manner route. Um, so if you have VTI routing is no. So then it sets up the route to the device and then it actually works properly here. Um, and then you can see we confirm that there's no errors in the access RAM stat. And there's the interface. Um, so if we, oh, it's already shut it. Oh, it, it, the test shuts down the interface already, so I can't show you.
armas. Oh, now it seems to work. Maybe I had I didn't have enough digits for the mask and the configuration. Um, Ah, this actually looks like clear text. Hold on. Oh, this is... No, it shouldn't matter. I actually don't even see the VTI interface now. Weird. Oh, there's something wrong with the VTI device here. Let's just give it a different name. Apparently it's not happy with this name. Sorry, I think there's something weird with either my kernel or with this version of Libreson that I have for the VTI support. Okay, well, if anyone has any other questions, just let me know. Yeah. Can you show the command that you use to run the casting in, please? Oh, um, I'll show you something better. Just Google for that. Let me turn off some. <laughs> oh, my DNS server is also broken. If you Google for Libreshawn testing, you'll find how to use our test system. Um, so that gives you a lot of details on how to use it. But in short, um, if you do make KVM help, it shows you all the test, all the targets we have for testing. Um, so basically you can do, the simple ones are, um, make KVM check. We'll basically download images, create all these VMs and all the networking things involved, and then run, um, and then we'll start to do uh, all the test cases. It will also produce output um, similar to this. So this is our, our run that continuously, whenever there's a new commit, it will start to do a new test run. Um, so it produces graphs, you can look at, so we'll pick the last completed one. Um, you can 
So you can go through all the test cases, see all these test cases are passing. Well, I'll pick one that's not passing. So you can see, um, so we'll look at this one. Ah, so this is where the test case still needs to be updated. This output was added to the test, so it, it shows up now as, a, as an error. Um, so make check will run all the tests. Um, there's also, um, so the, the, the basic structure is, if you go into the testing directory, um, so base configs has all the configs for all the machines. So you'll see road, north, east, uh, things that are for all. Um, X509 basically has the stuff to generate X509 certificates that are used in a test. Um, then utils is the utils used by the test um, uh, framework, so that's running on the host. And then there is guest bin, which is uh, the, the commands that are run on the guest. So the most important one you'll see, uh, so one is just swan transmogrify um, configures the network specifically for that test machine. So whether it's north or east, it will configure it based on that identity. And then swan prep will pick anything from a single test and configure the IPsec and everything else that needs to be configured. So then if you go to Pluto and I'll pick a basic test case, um, you'll see there's a test description, there's a configuration for east, there's a configuration for west. Um, if there's an init.sh script for the virtual machine, then um, it will boot up that machine and run that, run that script on it. So usually it's like prepare all the proper configurations, start IPsec, wait for IPsec to start, add the connection, print the status, and say you're done. And I will do the same for the other machine. And then after the init, the run script is called. In this case, it just brings up the tunnel, um, does a ping to confirm, does a traffic uh, status just to see the packets. And then the, all that output is captured and put in the output directory, and it's then diffed against the known output in the in the in the, the, the regular directory. So, so the the you see here the east console.txt is compared with output east console.txt, and that is the the diff you see here. So let's see if I have a more interesting failure. Um, This one is unexpected, let's see. Ah. So this one, it claimed to be an authenticated IPsec SA, and now it says it's anonymous IPsec SA. <coughs> and I know that we had a miscalculation there, so this test is probably an anonymous one. There's no description file, which is bad. <laughs> um, Oh, it's using the standard. So it's using, yeah, so it's using, I can tell here, it's using the standard include, so I know it's an anonymous one. So actually, this is correct. This is uh, the other the other one we had. So the, the test case didn't actually fail. It was actually the, the reference output here was actually wrong. So it needs updating. So I can update that. Um, oh, look, there's a VTI one failing. Ah. Did Stefan perhaps rename the VTI interface from IP underscore VTI zero to VTI zero in some kernel version? Oh, sorry, sorry. No, I, I see what happens now. Um, be, because we realized that we couldn't actually properly share the device and, and delete them without doing our own reference counting, we stopped deleting the device. And so we actually created VTI0, and in the reference output, we deleted the device. But in the new code, we no longer delete the device because uh, we can't ref count them, so we leave them existing. So that's why there's a plus line, you're right. It's nothing to do with you. <laughs> it's all our fault. Um, and you see as well, we have a bunch of, um, I think about 100 interrupt test cases with StrongSwan, um, so that we make sure that you know any new feature. Um, um, so so I've, I've also become, I think, the, the number one bug reporter for StrongSwan as well, uh, <laughs> because whenever they change something, like they change the default to something and it breaks us, or it, like, even if it doesn't really break, but it changes output, then, uh, then we notice it. So. 
At some point, Friends of Day started sending certificate certificate requests, even when their authentication was pre-shared key. And so we found out, <laughs> like, hey, this is a change in our output. So what's happening? Um, but we actually, um, on the, the IPsec uh, workshop we did in, what was it, March? Um, we met the Strong Sound team, and it was actually really good to talk to them and uh, exchange some some horror stories and uh, and some 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 warfare we've done, and so it was good. It was uh, it was um, it was great to actually meet them and, and work with them for a couple of days. Um, and uh, and and I think it's good in the open source community to have more than one implementation. Like people can you know they can now set up a Libra one and a Strong Sound server. So if something happens to one of them, they can go back to the other. Okay, so yeah, so so we'll be around if you have any questions related to IQ IPsec, just uh, catch one of us. And if you want to try out the lab and need help with virtual box or anything, you know, catch me anytime this week. So. Is there anyone here going to ITF after this or? No, sorry, I mean, um, after this conference, there's the IETF conference next week. Is anyone going there, here? Or are you all just like Linux kernel and then we're out of here?